John Lapine uh, from Cal Dining, filling in for Rafi Taharian as the voice of Campus Dining. <laughs> Jeff Suvier, you've all met. We have Lisa Feldman, who's the Director of Culinary Services for Sodexo. And when I asked Lisa in an email a few weeks ago, tell me what you're working on, it was a scrolling list. It wasn't just a single page view on a large monitor. So Lisa's got a lot on her plate these days. And she has a beautiful son, Max, who is quite quotable on social media. <laughs> um, we have Justin Timoneri, Certified Executive Chef and International Culinary Ambassador for the Florida Department of Agriculture. So a very unique role for promoting the products coming out of Florida. Wonderful. And then we've got Peter Glander, who is the Corporate Chef with Ruby Tuesday. Um, so those are the brief interviews. What I'd like to start with is, as the other um, moderators have done, to have each of you say a bit about your role, your background, what got you started in the culinary field, and why are you passionate about produce? Why does it matter? Peter, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, my name is Peter Glanner. I'm the corporate chef for Ruby Tuesday Restaurants. Um, we have 800 restaurants around the country. Um, I grew up on a farm in Indiana. Um, if I would not be a chef, I would be a farmer and mm -hmm. still am as much as I can today. Um, and it's basically, it's, I'm now in charge of, I started my career right here in New York City. Um, down the street here, up the street here, very fine dining French. You know, the, farmers mar <laughs> the Union Square Farmers Market guys are there by family still. Um, even in Tennessee, I still talk to them on a regular basis. But it's taking produce and putting it into more restaurants. We, we have a unique situation at Ruby Tuesday as we have this salad bar. Um, we're one of the last few um, that has this and trying to figure out how we can get more people to enjoy it and, and go through it and eat produce and it's the one differentiating thing for our restaurants and how do you, how do you make that in bolder, bigger and different, keep our business going and growing. Thanks Peter. Justin? All right, yes, uh, Justin Timonary and um, I'm a, uh, one of only probably maybe two uh, full-time agriculture, state agriculture chefs in the country, so very unique mm -hmm. position. Um, I, I incredibly love what I do. I've been at my position about almost 10 years now. Um, and what I get to do is really educate. I teach uh, consumers how to understand and incorporate um, the growing seasons and how to have fresh fruits and vegetables into their diet so they can uh, make, make great decisions. Uh, in Florida, we're a very unique state. We can grow all year round, and we take advantage of this. We have a $100 billion a year agriculture industry. So we do a lot to, to promote that, whether it's to our school children in the state of Florida getting uh, fresh fruits and vegetables into our schools, um, whether it's uh, promoting Florida agriculture all the way up the eastern seaboard um, into Canada, um, or whether it's uh, going into large shows uh, around the country. Um, not only our, our agricultural goods that, that are grown in the state of Florida, but also um, a lot of our seafood coming out of the Gulf and Atlantic. And uh, you know, we're so blessed in Florida, all of our stuff is, is naturally healthy. And so I create tons of recipes um, to get the consumers to, to simply cook very fresh, healthy. Um, you don't need a bunch of crazy ingredients, very simple techniques, very simple flavors, utilizing the natural flavors of the fruits and vegetables and uh, maybe incorporating a little bit of fresh herbs and spices and uh, to make wonderful dishes that are healthy and uh, you know cook things that have an immediate impact on the way we not only feel, um, look and act every day. So uh, it, it's really a lot of fun and I'm very blessed to be able to do what I do. Good man. Lisa. <clears throat> so um, I am the uh, director of culinary for our non-retail entities at Sodexo. So all of the places that don't have a cash transaction. So I'm responsible for menus for little kids through schools, uh, resident dining and campus, um, patient tray lines and hospitals, uh, senior living centers, all the places where nobody really thinks about the food too much, mm -hmm. but they should um, because that's where all of our consumers are eating every single day. Um, they're sort of a captive audience, if you will. Um, so it's a great place to, uh, to educate um, and, and change eating patterns, which is awesome. Um, how did I become a chef? Uh, Self-defense. <laughs> My mom um, has a repertoire of about three dishes. One of them is edible, 
and she can burn water. <laughs> She's very, she very talented. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, as I started college and was headed towards a um, degree in political science with an emphasis in revolutionary theory, I thought to myself, what am I going to do when I graduate? Because all I'm going to be qualified is uh, for is starting a revolution in the third world country. <laughs> and I thought, you know, everyone's got to eat. So I jumped ship and went to culinary school instead. Um, graduated from CIA. Um, and actually, I think that, um, you know, why produce? Produce is sort of that revolution that, that we need to be starting. It's like the great unsung hero of the plate. Um, in some instances, when you have a culinary intervention around produce, you, you encounter somebody who's like, I hate Brussels sprouts. There's nothing that you can do to a Brussels sprout that will make me want to eat it. And then you blow their minds by roasting them and introducing things like mustard, balsamic vinegar, sauerkraut even. Um, I had an eight-year-old who was eating literally fistfuls of, mm -hmm. of mustard roasted Brussels sprouts with sauerkraut and just declaring them like the best thing ever. Um, and their mom was like, did you drug him? What happened? So, <laughs> no, just proper technique. So, um, you know, really to be able to, to put more proper culinary technique out into the marketplace and really get people jazzed about eating produce, I think is really why I'm here. I'm going to make a little short interlude here. Um, earlier today, Jim mentioned um, uh, an initiative the Culinary Institute of America started in 2010 called the Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative. This is a group of 36 leaders from volume food service operations across all sectors. And we have four members here today, Peter, Lisa, Ann, and John. And um, Lisa right now is co-chairing the Produce Working Group. And when this initiative started in 2010, it was started because there was pressure on the retail, uh, the retail and food service industries about levels of sodium in the food supply. The Institute of Medicine was just about to release a report, and the Culinary Institute of America brought together some food service leaders to say, do you want to work collaboratively on reducing sodium? And they all said, yeah, it's a pretty big deal and we need some help. And then one of the, the gentlemen invited to this said, but we'd really like to work on something we're all really passionate about and something that puts a smile on chef's faces, and that's produce. Can we also work on increasing produce? And we at the CIA said, yes. So that's how it all started. And now we're you know, six years in, and we've got growing enthusiasm. So Lisa, I just want to thank you publicly for your leadership on the Produce Working Group and moving that initiative forward. Next, to Susie. Susie Homemaker. I'm the, I knew nothing about cooking, but I love good food. So if I can cook, you can cook. <laughs> Am I supposed to answer like Rafi, or do I get to make up my own answer? Yeah, answers? I was going to give Sean a sock <laughs> puppet so he really could play the role of Rafi via yeah. a sock puppet. I'm, I'm admittedly not a trained chef. I'm a business manager, and I'll admit it. I actually got into the food business by being a weekend bar manager at a college. Well, I got my poli-sci degree, so there, there's, there's hope for all of us, maybe. But, uh, you know, predominantly, uh, I've been in college dining um, my career about 27 or 28 years now. I wasn't 12. Um, and um, I, I've always felt that I've been able to kind of um, uh, see a trend coming. And, you know, in the 90s it was brands, and we did that on college campuses, and they were short-lived. And uh, we knew that students eventually wanted more, and then they started wanting uh, casual dining profile like food, like Ruby Tuesday, how can I have a plate that looks, you know, remember the big massive plates of 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago? And, um, uh, and, and I really believe that this is a, uh, a uh, trend, not a fad. I think that uh, college dining, you know, it used to be that we'd have people come and talk to us about uh, food and menus and how much of your menu is vegetarian. And uh, I used to say about 70% of it's vegetarian. If you go into a dining hall anywhere, when you really look at it, you know, if you count milk and eggs and things as vegetarian, they're vegetarian. But uh, I just measured it. We took our procurement from last year and we measured it in our, our our animal protein, including meat and cheese and eggs and everything, was 20.63% only. Uh, now, of course, the other 80% isn't all good for you food. You know, uh, our soda company is one of those uh, big spends in there. But uh, I think that that's just the way that people are eating. I think that it's uh, uh, trending, and, and, and I think that uh, um, I myself, from going through a, a personal change, again, uh, might just be my age, but I just think that uh, when you do add flavor to produce, instead of just putting Brussels sprouts on a plate, 
but roasting them and some spices and oil and all that other stuff, yum, yum. And uh, um, the more you can do that, the better. I think the roasting in the oven versus just steaming it and putting it in a pan is the future of food service. I think you're going yeah, to see a lot less uh, steamers, maybe even a lot more smokers. So uh, I just think that it's a trend that's uh, coming. It's on the way. I think that uh, people are focused on, uh, and I'll mention another CIA program I mentioned this morning, Menus of Change. You know, they have 20 tenants. One of them is less meat, better meat, which I think people would prefer to have a better piece of meat, but less of it. Uh, you know, things like that. And how can you work in more uh, produce? Again, I, I prefer whole produce over incorporating produce into things. But, you know, an Asian dish or a burrito really has many components plus some protein. So uh, I think it's just something that's here and it's just going to be, uh, become more and more and more and it's going to build. And, you know, the tipping point I think has already passed us for the, particularly the young consumer. And I really do believe we're all going to be catching up, because they do. I mean, remember this morning, for those of you that were here, if it's sick, it's uh, cool. And, and, you know, odd-colored carrots yes. are cool. Uh, so those kinds of things, I just think, are becoming more and more uh, standard in the college dining business. All right. Well, now that we've gotten through kind of the round of first remarks, I want to dig in further to the process of menu item development. And Peter, you've been with us all day, and you know each panel was supposed to address a different part of the process, but it's hard to stop a story short. Um, but talk to us about what are, how do you guys manage identifying trends? How do you go through the process of identifying potential new menu items? And how do you do the consumer testing? Um, it's, it's all inclusive, so I think this is actually really interesting. The first group to the second group to the third group, it's, it's one after another. So. You need to know what your problem is. You need to know what you're trying to do. I think all of us in this room, this is about produce. How do we get more produce on the, on the menu? How do we get more produce? I'll say for us is, you know, it's a cornerstone to our brand. It's a cornerstone to what we do. It's maybe the one differentiating thing about Ruby Tuesday is that we have this salad bar. So for us is to look at this and say, hey, how do we, how do we leverage this? How do we get more of this product to the consumer? How do we get the consumer more excited about it? And how do we make that happen? We have to know what else is out there. We have to know what the other salad restaurants are. We have to know what's trending, what's hot. I mean, I can go around New York City right now to DC, to Dallas, to San Antonio, to California, to, you know, we went on a big tour. I mean, very similar to what um, Chef did when he went through this morning. We went on a big tour to look at salad restaurants. In two days, we went through 38 restaurants solely based on salads. We think about our brand as a salad restaurant with a full menu on the side that is changing big time how we think about our restaurants. It's changing how we staff, it's changing how we look at food, it's changing how we pay the employees. All of these components, because you have to think about, you know, for us today is saying, how do we keep our brand alive for tomorrow? And the consumer is changing in everybody's business. The Chipotles are growing quickly. Um, they're moving fast. Well, hopefully with produce, maybe not the best person to talk to. Talk to the produce committee about that. But um, you have to understand every component of it. The R&D side of it, you have to be a chef mentality. There has to be thoughts about it. Severe's totally right. I mean, simple food is the easiest food. We're working on a couple things, roasted broccoli. I mean, it's going gangbusters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's simple. It's Heat. some oil, some chili flakes, some no salt. No water touching it. No, it's roasted broccoli and it's going gangbusters. Now everybody's concerned about what's the yield, what's this, what's that. Well, the <laughs> issue is, is that the yield isn't a factor when the guests love it. And they're willing to Be pay for it. At that because time. they're coming back. And, and we did a test not long ago. In, in one week, one restaurant increased sales 30% by changing only produce items. Yes. Right? And I can't go super detailed in all these, but it is a produce is a cornerstone to our business and to our brand. And understanding, really taking a chef mentality and cooking a dinner party. I mean, that was kind of the, uh, what was proposed to me is, you know, in my time at Ruby Tuesday, it's always been very conscious and very, oh, you need to do this but with this, this behind it and this behind it. It literally said, hey, make it the way the chef wants to see it. We're at that point now. We have the Ferrari. We have this nice idea. Now operationalize it at that point. Yeah, now I need, hey, I do need whole peeled carrots. Uh, the operations team's having a tough time peeling carrots. OK, well, now we find whole peeled carrots. All right, no problem. Well, let's go get it done. But to get a whole peeled carrot, I need to talk to the carrot vendor. 
Well, guess what? The distribution team can't find a vendor that has a whole peeled carrot. Now we need to talk to the carrot vendor, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Can, do you have a whole peeled carrot? Can I get a whole peeled carrot? Now how do I get this I whole peeled this. carrot from California to Tennessee to New York to Maine to Florida? And this is where this, you know, the chef can have a great idea. We can go to the farmer's market and get good food. But if we can't get the food distributed to our restaurants, into that area, it's difficult. I think the single biggest change, the single biggest op opportunity that we have here is we have to figure out how to get the food from the field to the guest. The, the distribution system of America is challenging. It's very challenged. Whether it be from school food service, from nice restaurants, you know, from how do you it's get easier for us because we are willing to pay a lot more. Yeah. How do you get in from the field that's when, you know, I heard a story about somebody, the cheese in Italy after an earthquake or something, and all the cheese went, all the cheese fell after a big earthquake, and they ended up making a dish and selling it somewhere quickly. How do we do that in America? It's, it's not done yet. Yeah. And we have to figure out how to utilize it and how to get it, how to get it out there. Not, not, deep, not easy. It's difficult, but those are the things we have to figure out, I really think. Long-winded. But a lot of important points there. I was thinking if I was on Twitter, there's a lot I would have captured from what you just said, Peter. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to Lisa, because Lisa, I think you have a very important case study to share on what you've done with the meat mushroom blend burgers. And just for a little bit of background here, this was something that came out of the Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative. 2008, 2009, recession was hitting, commodity prices started to creep up, and the industry was saying, we're in a little bit of trouble here. The American consumer still wants beef, but we're dying over food costs. What are we going to do? At the same time, Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative is looking at how do we improve the quality of menu items? How do we drive down sodium? Um, how do we change the American palate for the amount of animal-based proteins? And this idea came up for a sensory study with consumers. Would they accept something if part of the beef was replaced by mushrooms? So we ran 147 consumers through a research study with the UC Davis sensory science team Overwhelmingly across all age groups, demographics, socioeconomic status, people like this concept. Better flavor was the number one reason why. 100% beef didn't taste as good as something that was 50% mushroom, 50% beef. So Lisa then, ch faced with some new school food service regulations and challenges on the size of a burger patty, said, hmm, is there a possibility? You want to walk us through how that worked and how you did the testing with it with students? Sure. Um, so, yeah, as I was sitting and, and, and watching um, a presentation on the consumer data that came back and the acceptability of it, I, st I started to think, okay, well, if I have to hit for school food service a certain amount of protein that I have to put on a plate, but I don't want to exceed that because my budget is about a dollar five a meal, which I might add is less than you would have to feed a prisoner. Um, <laughs> how, swear to God, how? How am I going to extend the product so that I've got good bun coverage with you know, a relatively small um, uh, product? And mushrooms made perfect sense to me. So we actually went to a couple of companies that create um, uh, products for school food service and said, would you make a meat mushroom blend? And they said, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> so Yeah, they were, no, not really. Um, and actually, the mushroom council reached out first. And then I said, well, I'd buy like seven million of them. Will you make them now? And they were mm -hmm. like, actually, yes, yes, we will. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. So, um, so we started down the path to try and figure out how to commercialize a product. Um, and one of the things that came up was that USDA, we buy commodities from USDA. We buy beef, um, amongst other products. Um, and they hadn't actually looked at mushrooms as a commodity. So we put the right people in the room with the USDA and said, could diced IQF mushrooms be a commodity? And they were like, why not? You would think that you'd have to jump through a lot of hoops with the government to make a decision like that, but I think it took less than a year to get it onto, onto the commodity list. It was very quick. So it was just a matter of having the right people in the room. Um, then trying to figure out how to commercialize and, and operationalize that, that burger patty, and then ultimately that's got to roll into a school district and be handled by not terrifically high-trained labor. Um, and, and then be served to a child. <clears throat> and so there was all of this talk at the other end, and suddenly somebody was like, shouldn't we maybe test with kids and find out if they even want to eat this? So we did this very cool thing where we basically took over a high school and we switched all the beef products out to a, a meat mushroom blend. So we had meatballs, we had burger patties, 
we had um, taco meat, and we told them that we switched out the beef products on every station except for their traditional taco stations. We had, one, we had dueling stations. We had one that was a meat mushroom blend and one that was regular taco meat, um, straight up ground beef. The traditional taco station was a ghost town. The other one had a line that wrapped completely around the dining room. It did 200% more than the unblended product. And for, at that moment, we knew we were fine. Um, and then we did a lot of other uh, acceptability testing with the students. I want to say that the mushroom burger was, had an 88% per approval rating. And when compared with the existing burger that had no mushroom added to it, we said, would you rather eat A or B? 90% of them said that they wanted the one with the mushrooms, which was amazing. And what we discovered was we're actually able to drop the sodium and the calories and the fat because um, we were actually able to go to a, a slightly smaller burger, burger for the smaller elementary kids um, and, and still have good bun coverage. And the mushrooms, because they're hydrophilic, were holding all the juices in the burger, so they weren't drying out or getting really tough. So um, we just recently, as of this past August, switched all of our burgers across the country in all Sodexo accounts to a mushroom blend. And so far, it's been completely quiet, which is the best you could hope for. <laughs> so. so one of the things that we were supposed to address on this panel is, is the timelines for these kinds of rollouts. And in this case, it started with an idea in 2011 with a number of skeptical food service operators saying, sounds good, but we're not going to commit to it. We're not going to move forward unless we know what the consumer thinks of this. Then we had the consumer data in 2012. Well, now it finally rolled out into schools nationwide in your system in 2015. So very different timelines. And we heard earlier, you know, John Coker pushes the envelope very quickly, is w willing to take a lot of risk. You know, as he changes over his menu, Sean, you, you are able to change things fairly quickly. Um, let's go if back to available. Peter. Pardon? If they're available. If they are available, they right, we've got the availability from, issue. Yeah. Um, Peter, let's go back to you. What is the timeline? Roasted broccoli, let's take a very specific example. From the idea when you said, hey, let's try this, how do you go through the process, what's the timeline, and do you put it into test market, or is it nationwide roll-up? Yeah, so it's got to go through its idea, concept, consumer testing, then national rollout. And that time frame can be, it's a minimum of six months, it's probably a year. Um, I do think, though, that the folks that are winning in the game today are pushing that timeline and being able to get that timeline faster. Mm -hmm. The consumers have changed. Mm -hmm. The consumer needs have changed. Uh, you're in this, uh, I'm speak, looking at other partners in the room that are doing the same thing, trying to move faster, trying to move quicker to get those timelines done. The consumer insight side of this, the, the testing for the, for the students and getting guest reaction to it is extremely important. But Getting that guest reaction in a time that you can actually make change and make it happen while it's yeah. still working is how you're going to win. Um, it's in the C store business. It's it's difficult. It's it's you know it's a hard. You can't make changes as quick. You know, Matt, McDonald's has a lot more restaurants than we do. Um, to make something for them, it's it's a great. You know, I use blueberries as an example all the time. It it takes years. They need to plant physical blueberries to get the blueberries done. Broccoli for us is a commodity we're buying already. Now the challenge for broccoli, I really need broccoli in a slightly smaller size because we're going through such volume that I didn't know until we put it into test that I need a slightly smaller cut size in the broccoli. So these are the things now I'm going back, all right, it's been three months since I started the project. It'll go to test in January, need to read the test for a month and a half, two months, by the time you get it out to national rollout, it's, I mean, at that point, it's a question of what's the volume, where do you go, how's it go, what's the other components of it? There's a lot of moving pieces to it, and I think that's where being able to set it up from the very beginning with what the supplier is, knowing what's out there, knowing where it's going, and knowing and partnering at the front end, you're never going to build a restaurant without having a, a, contractor, in a, a contractor in a design group. Yep. You're not just going to go in and say, I'm going to make it happen. Well, it'll pop up in your house. I mean, yes, yep. but it, you have to have a team to get it going. And I think that the team has to be, dis the entire distribution chain has to be involved in that conversation from the very beginning if you want to speed it up. 
The consumers are demanding it's faster. The consumers are demanding it's faster. I mean, you know, I'm talking big business. Wendy's has, has got a heck of an R&D group. They, they go very fast. They always change out ideas. They always look for new things. But they also are moving pretty fast on it. And they have a marketing team that is, that's killing it. And so, Justin, you know, this concept of needing partners, needing communication, what can you offer to folks in the restaurant and food service world in terms of partnership and moving forward that ideation cycle? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, it, it does take quite a bit to, um, you know, once you start and you have these wonderful ideas that you want to do and then making them a reality um, is oftentimes a different, uh, quite a different thing, just sourcing the different ingredients that you're looking for, whether you know, the amount you need and, and finding these, um, these farms that, that have them or, and, and can provide or, or, or these large um, food service distributors that you're already dealing with and getting those products and maybe they have to look and, and source um, products that you need. So there, there are certainly challenges there, but, you know, with all the, um, you know, the different trends that are, that are coming forward, consumers are certainly asking for, for more fresh products, more natural um, style of, of products. And, you know, as um, you know, chefs and restaurateurs, and we all need to be aware of this and be able to cater to to those different kind of kinds of needs that um, that they're asking for, and and these trends, and be able to anticipate these as well. So, it takes a good bit of research and and, and a lot of um, you know understanding of our different groups that we work with. So there's there's certainly a lot going on there. Um, you know, I mostly deal with with consumers. Um, in mind, creating, um, you know, getting consumers to, to educate uh, them about, about what's going on and, um, you know, with, with different food trends and, and incorporating that as well. But it's, it's no easy task for these um, large volume restaurants as well. So, Sevier, you are um, working on opening a new restaurant location to be determined. Um, how do you think about your new menu development? and what's, what's going to test with consumers, how quickly you're going to turn something off the menu if it's not performing well. How do you measure that? You know, I'll, Amy, I'll go back to the first restaurant. When I opened in Davie in 2004, I was ashamed as an Indian to eat the garbage that is passed off as Indian across the planet. Indian food, unlike oat French cuisine, the highest and most delicious Indian food is cooked at the Indian homes. The restaurants in India were for the unfortunate of the, in India, that people who didn't have a home or a loving mother or parent to cook for them went to a restaurant. They ate garbage. There was no love being put to the food. The best food of India is in our homes. So when I got here, I was ashamed for so many, from 1993 to 2004, I never, I could, I was ashamed of restaurants. I would go for free, teach the chef to three or four dishes, then bring the New York Times food critic, get them reviewed, and then have the owner invest more money in training the chef. I did that for gratis for 11 years. And then when I got into Columbia University to do a PhD in uh, the Middle, Middle Eastern languages and religion, three days later, an investor gave me $5 million and said, open a restaurant. I pulled out of Columbia, opened a restaurant. He said to me, what do you want to do? I said, I will, I'll do a tasting menu. And he said, what is that? My investor was Indian with very little uh, understanding of gourmet dining. So as he said, how much will you charge for it? I said, $95. <laughs> he said, $95 a person? I said, yes, this is 2004. We were charging $140 by the end, and c consumers were paying for it. When you give quality, when you demand from yourself the best you can do, my staff was dying to do what I could dream of. They were the people making me look good. I had a dream, they translated into reality. Baldor brought everything I needed to me. I was willing to give money. This man is New York Mafia. He can move the planet for your, his chefs. He brought everything I could dream of. Finger limes from Frida's. In the Cooking Light magazine called my finger lime shrimp bruschettas, the best discovery of the year two years ago. The finger lime makes people jump. The sourness, the texture. So for me, Amy, the easy, in New York City, in Union Square, the farmer's market was there, we were willing to pay the money. If people are paying $24 for okra, eight ounces, I can buy as much as I want. So you know, from us, the reality is, in a gourmet, high-end restaurant, you can dream, 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 and deliver dreams. San Francisco, where I'm opening a restaurant, it's challenge, challenge, location. 
Finding a location is a challenge, but I can tell you the only thing that I see as a challenge is our commitment to being honest to ourselves. Because if we are willing, this young man, Peter, I'm a huge fan of his. When he told me he worked with Ruby Tuesday, my romance with him ended for a second. Because he was working with me and I said, oh my God, this man is a hero. And then I came home and by the time I came home, I said, what do I think of him? I said, you know what, I can only feed 200 people a night. His hard work changes so many lives and he does it. So please keep doing what you do, fight the battles and you can do what we do. I really, my life is luxurious and easy feeding 200 people with a lot of money coming in. I can dream and make my dreams happen. There are no challenges. But the food service people, it's hurdle after hurdle. But the ones that believe, three of them here that I know, they make change happen overnight. Yes, it's two years or three years of overnight, but they can make it happen, do what they do. They believe, they take the risk, and it happens. Sean, how do you utilize consultants in your process of innovation and, and adding new energy to your operations? Uh, well, we used to use consultants a lot, but I'm a public school that's lost a great deal of state funding. So, um, uh, and Severe used to be one of them, but uh, 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 luckily our business has been very strong uh, since we got a concession and catering contract at our stadium arena about three years ago, and they added net uh, 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 results from that are able to fuel a lot of our things that we're doing now. And we hired a, actually, a, there's a consultant that works with Google and um, Bon Appetit called Kristen Rasmussen that is actually a, an instructor on our campus and is actually working on the world of, mm -hmm. uh, she's working with David Eisenberg's yes. conference, the world of healthy kitchens. Healthy, 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 healthy kitchens, healthy. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, she wasn't too expensive. Uh, she's getting married, so I could get her cheap. And, uh, <laughs> and, and um, she has been working with our, our folks on designing uh, browns in the menu. And it was really exciting for me to see her and her ideas and how she wanted to do root to stem. You know, we do a, a panini, a, a beet and goat cheese panini root to stem. And, you know, we used to throw away the, the greens, right? Well, they make wonderful greens on a sandwich. But, um, utilize them more, but on a public school we can't, so we have to become um, our own little self-consultants and uh, uh, try to find out ways to do it ourselves. And luckily I've been able to find enthusiastic folks in California that are willing to work for us uh, that uh, are just amazing at, uh, oh, I want to do this, I want to do it right now. And you know, sometimes I have to slow them down and sometimes I have to ask them to speed it up. But uh, you know, I think that the uh, uh, process of looking at it is, is, is becoming uh, simple when with distribution there. I mean, the distribution issue with us, and I'm going to make a statement that I'm, I'm sorry that the uh, other uh, culinary, because, you know, the objection when uh, uh, one of the students said organic is more healthy, I agree that it's not, I mean, from a study point of view, but I also know that I have physicians uh, in the Bay Area beat me up that, organic is better, and here's my study, and yada yada. So, um, but I do think that the consumer, and, and particularly more and more the, the demographic used by Whole Foods and people like Cliff Bar and things, lifestyle of health and sustainability, they squash health and sustainability together for better or worse. We can educate them, but you know how hard it is to educate people on the food business anyway. But if it feels better for you, like organic, you're going to buy more of it. And uh, what I'm trying to educate students on now is particularly local purchasing. We have found a number of small growers that um, um, aren't organic uh, farmers or aren't certified, but farm organic yeah. and bringing those. But then again, I'm limited on how many small farmers I can bring in. And then what's their volume? We were using a, a small farmer and he can only supply ourselves, Airbnb and Google seven months of the year you know, his fruits and vegetables, and then we're looking and scrambling otherwise. So, and he does a great job uh, for us, but, so distribution is really a, a really difficult thing. Uh, I wish the kohlrabi gentleman was still here because, you know, that the, having the bigger um, size for our, our resident halls would be awesome because it is trendy, but also to just have it on the menu and, and have a different kind of vegetable there. Students get really, really interested in it, and, and particularly with the ethnic mix of our campus and any campus anymore, I just think people are fascinated with foods as they learn from each other on a college campus. 
they, de they develop that interest and that interest drives them to try those kinds of things. But I'll put him to task. He is telling us it, it takes him time, but after he signed my contract, he wanted me there the next day. It didn't take him three years <laughs> to get me there. I said, we don't even have a kitchen. He said, I have that kitchen. Just do it. Start it. <laughs> get over there. <laughs> and we, we never moved to a new kitchen. It worked three years. We were doing yep. it with the terrible Chinese kitchen the Indian chef inherited. All rocks. <laughs> and so we trained chefs to cook Indian food in a Chinese kitchen equipment, and it worked. Mm -hmm. So this man, is he believes in what he believes, and he runs with it. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, Peter, um, do you guys use outside consultants for help? Do you use chefs who um, work with your produce distributors? How do you guys use outside resources in the innovation process? Um, well, we had a contract with Severe, so yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we use consultants quite a bit. Um, especially, uh, we, we use a lot of vendor consultants. Um, a lot of vendors have uh, really, really talented chefs on staff. Um, and I probably reach out to them you know, on an almost daily or weekly basis just to bounce ideas around. So, yeah, absolutely. So you welcome those calls. You welcome that interaction when a produce distributor says, we have culinary talent and he or she would like to chat with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and sure. don't they come and offer you training and travel to these? It's amazing what yep. they do for them. Yeah, I mean, just looking at, you know, uh, collaboration, like we had a collaboration with Severe. I mean, we then have to take whatever gets created and operationalize it across the country. So we'll use vendor chefs that we partner with to go out and do operations training. We, we had a question earlier about, you know, the interest in, and it was the kohlrabi guy saying, you know, how do I get to you? How do I get my ingredient, my product in front of you? And there was, uh, you know, a little bit of tension in the room, and Gene from Denny's was sitting there, and he made the point about, you know, don't call me unless you know my business. So, you know, it was a really important point, and I think young salespeople who aren't familiar um, with food service in particular struggle with this, and so figuring out, you know, how do you put the right information and resources in front of your sales team so that when you make contact with someone like Peter, or Lisa, or Sean, or anybody on this panel, you've got that hook that you understand their business, and now, hey, let me help provide um, a solution to one of your challenges. Amy, to that point, for the years that I worked with Sodexo, they were working with local farmers and local cooks who were at farmer's markets, buying them out. Because if they saw an ingredient or a dish that was singing and dancing, they bought them out, and those businesses grew sukis. They were supporting vendors with a dream through their dreams. And so it can work if there's a will to make it work. It's a challenge, though. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very realistic point, right? So the comment about kohlrabi, I, I wanted to raise my hand and talk, too. I would love to have kohlrabi. A big, giant kohlrabi does me no good. Does me no good. What am I going to do with a big giant kohlrabi? I'm going to have to get a guy a special knife to cut it. I'm going to have to make a video to teach, teach him how. I mean, heaven forbid that I need an extension on my contract for liability. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I probably need another plug in the kitchen because we didn't want to put a plug in early on. I'm serious. That's what you're right. I know. I mean, these, and then, by the way, let's talk about quality assurance and the health risks of. Where's his, where's his kohlrabi coming from? Is it washed? Is it clean? No, it is. is it's it... delicious. I just cooked with it. It was amazing. You, know? you can make coleslaw out of the kohlrabi. <laughs> I, I love kohlrabi. I, I used to buy the guys. You're being devil's advocate. I, I used know. to buy them out. I mean, it, but the balance of every component of this, so you have chef ideation. Chef ideation is, you know, kind of this fine dining thought process. How do you make the best? How do you make it great? After that, it comes to creating it, putting it out on a bar, putting it out in your restaurant, making this nice dish. Then you operationalize it, then you figure out what the pieces are. At that point, you need to figure out where are you buying it from, how much does it cost, is it safe, can you get it distributed to your restaurants, and then you need to get in your restaurants. I have storage with shelving. I don't have enough shelving. Okay, so how do I get enough shelving? Well, I don't have enough shelving. I have my deliveries that come twice a week. Do I need three days a week? Well, if I need three days a week, then I need to go to here. Well, then do you order your produce from a local produce vendor? Well, then I got the quality assurance people saying that we're going to have a Chipotle outbreak if we have something that comes in this idea. Okay, how does this balance out? What does this go? How does this look like? And produce is the key to our restaurants. It's the key to a lot of restaurants. The, the beef industry has it down pat. I mean, it's, it's, it's so scientific. Every, every truck has temp tells on it. Every truck, you know, with the temperature, the timing, literally, I, we can satellite track where our salmon is. Uh, we know exactly where our salmon shipments are. If we want to see where our salmon is, we can go find out exactly where the shipment is. For us, produce is by no means like that. It gets stuck. Sometimes it's stuck sitting on a dock at the, 
at the border that I don't know how long it's sitting there. I get it back to a semi, and the semi is frozen in the front, refrigerated here and dry on this end, but it needs to go from Maryland to Maine, and it's a two-day route, right? I can't put basil on that same truck. It, it's not going to work out. How does, that, how does that play? What does it look like? It, there are real challenges, and I think those are the challenges that even, you know, in Sodexo, if you can buy out local farmers markets, yes, but when you get to the... But that's know, one station. They have it when they can do it. Yeah, but it's in, not every day. Bi in big cities, New York City, it's great. You know, right? what, what about Indianapolis? Mm -hmm. what, what about Kansas City, Oklahoma City, you know, Nashville? It, those it gets it starts in the it starts in the corners of the country in the big cities and moves throughout. We have to figure out how to do that. So shifting gears, we're going to uh, open it up for audience questions in just a moment. But I want to start with Sean. Um, you've got in front of you your peers who are operators, you've got some students, you've got major distributors, you've got grower shippers. What do you want them to know about your business so that you can do better in the future through partnership with people in this room? And I want everybody to address this question. What do you guys need? I, I, a degree and an understanding of who's coming to sell to us, uh, you know, like the gentleman from Denny's. I mean, too often we have people come and talk to us about things and go, do you, have you Google anything yet to understand a little bit about what we do and our direction, uh, how we view sustainability. I mean, it's all on the web page. I mean, I think I have 500 pages on our web page, something crazy like that. So you can learn a lot by uh, doing those kinds of things. But I think that understanding that and then be, being prepared with distribution versus coming to it, hoping that because of our high volume, we'll drive the distribution. Because not always do I want to be able to slot all those kinds of things uh, for that. Uh, but um, you know, generally things like that. Okay, so you want salespeople who know who you are, who visited your website, read up on your business, and they want a distribution answer for you versus an additional challenge for you. Well, I, I, I'd rather have them come with me with solutions, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I ask very little. Okay, so everybody in agreement here, easy to do, you can handle Sean's business. Suvir, what do you I want from this room? I would say bring a taste of what, the, what they could sell to their customer and give them story, real stories of people who are like going crazy about what you're giving them. And if you give them that recipe, give them a taste, chefs are not the issue. This is the man who's a trouble. The chef's dream, the operation head kills the dreams. So if you, can, if you can bring them to a room together, dream killer, if the dream killer and his wife taste and fall in love, they will make your dreams happen. So we need, we need chef and their dream killer together falling in love with one dish. Next day America will forget all the distribution issues because the wife of the dream killer will say, oh honey, that's so luscious. So make it sexy, make it good, make the man who kills the dreams love it. The chefs will get all the money they need to make the nation move. That's my two pennies. Lisa, what do you need? Um, for me, it's, it's, you know, is whatever you're bringing to me realistic for my business? Mm. You know, can it be operationalized? Because yeah. if you've got the, a pie in the sky dream and you show up with a giant rutabaga, <laughs> I'm just going to be like, yeah. <laughs> What am I going to do with that? Yeah, or kohlrabi, whatever it might be. If you show me something where that kohlrabi is shredded and Processed, can get turned yeah. into something that I can feed to an eight-year-old, then it's a different conversation. And so, one thing you forgot to tell us, that $1.10 for kids, how much do you pay for milk every day from that? 25 so how much is left for food? Uh, about 80 cents. So see, that's why we feed what we feed. Right. All right, Justin. Well, for me, I, you know, I think it would be, you know, for all of these different institutions, large or small, to understand more about the seasonal availability of what's grown here in the United States. Um, we're so used in this country to be able to, and obviously he's, he's chuckling down there because it is a large challenge. It, you know, we're, we're so used to be able to buy tomatoes all year, all year round. Year. And guess what? Well, tomatoes do not grow in the United States all year round. Um, and this example goes on for many, many other things. So I believe we really have to, to train ourselves as well as our customers on all different levels that, that hey, you know, I understand you, when you order a sandwich, then you expect to have a tomato on there. But guess what? This tomato is coming from Guatemala. Or it's coming from, you know, wherever. Um, and it's not coming from the U.S. where we have, uh, you know, strict policies and where we know that, 
that it's going to be not only healthy, but it's going to be a safe product. So, you know, there, there are some really big challenges there, but, but trying our best to, to really buy within season um, not only ensures we have fresh products, but that those products are in the peak of, of, their, um, of their flavor and their, their vitality, their, their nutrient content. So I think that's one thing that, that we can, can focus on and really do, do a better job of our understanding. Peter, what's on your wish list? Partnership. partnership is the thing for me. It's, it's being honest, it's being truthful. Food is real. We must just break it down and say there's a feeling and emotion and drive to the students that are here. Graduate of the CIA, graduate from culinary school, worked in fine dining in New York City for a long time. I know big business, I know small business, all the pieces, be passionate, love it. People think I'm crazy because I talk about produce and I sit in the boardroom and say, I would, if I would not be here, I would be a farmer. They're like, okay, I'm giving a presentation and I'm wearing my work boots. And I ask the vendors from, the salad vendors to bring me dirt from the field where they grow the lettuce. Aww. That's passion, it's understanding, it's feel. I ask people to smell the dirt from where the lettuce is grown. It's an emotion, and we have to get back to emotion in food, and partnership is the way to make that happen. And without that, it's, we're fighting a battle that is almost, it's dead from the beginning. Seasonality is the ante to the ball game today. It doesn't matter. I mean, in my business, it's the ante. You have to. I mean, there's a Firestone tire commercial out there now that's talking about handcrafted tires. <laughs> I mean, it, there, there literally is a national advertising campaign for Firestone, they should Google it. it, and it says, Firestone tires are now handcrafted. And they're charging extra for that. Uh, I mean, okay, handcrafted. But we won't give that money for food. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, it's, we're talking about what we're ingesting. But I think the gentleman here from Florida said the right thing. As a nation, we have to go back to being honest. Yeah. And saying we'll miss apples till next season. In my home, we live in New York State with amazing apple orchards. We only eat them from October till January when the yep. orchards have them fresh and not from the last season. Because yeah. they have what is this year we'll get from the cold storage comes out the following year. So we only eat it for the season and then we miss them till they come back in October. This nation doesn't realize that's how the world eats. Yep. So that's the other conversation to have. Yeah. I think the caveat though is that when you look at the education market, campus, schools, the prime growing season, the, uh, they're closed. So mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, there needs to be, we need to take a look at vegetable processing and stop making it the devil. Um, there is nothing wrong with eating yes. well-maintained frozen produce if yes. it's prepared correctly. Right. Or canned. Sister. Exactly. Um, All kinds of vegetables are fine. Exactly. All right. Um, I would like to open it up to questions from the audience. And Rich, I saw you uh, kind of do a wild gesture there on the food safety issue. If there's anything you'd like to say about that, um, it's an important issue that we've kind of danced around. So, and I can speak for Tim too, because he's, he, you know, he, he's always been a, a great leader of, of, of food safety and what happens in the industry as, as we like to believe we are. So, you know, I mean, our job as distributor, whether it's to 800 units or one unit or one campus, whatever it is, we have to treat everything the same. All of our requirements are the same. Everything that we do is built around trying to figure out a way to qualify our suppliers, our fresh produce suppliers in a way, keep our cold chain 100% intact to protect you. I, I think you buy from people like us because you assume that we're taking care of you. You really don't want to worry about Liability. Can I see all the audits of the suppliers and growers that you're doing business with? Yep. There, there are some assumptions made. Right. Um, but nevertheless, I, th I think many times it's not always the forefront of everyone's thinking. And, and, and it's not, it, there's an investment <laughs> for a distributor to do it right from beginning to end. And, when, and, and especially when we start talking about what you're talking about now, which is small farmers, which we respect and we help in every way we possibly can, but even the new FISMA rules are allowing very small farmers not to have the same qualifications 
as large farmers, which is ridiculous to me because the large farmers have a lot more investment in protecting you than a small farmer, quite frankly. Liability, you know, when I was buying the lamb chops at Davy, my restaurant, New York Times called them the best in New York City. Thomas Keller very quickly asked me, where do you buy them from? A farm in Pennsylvania. I took the $2.5 million liability for the farmer. He didn't have the money to pay for it. I said, I'll pay for it. Just keep, growing, keep giving us lamb. Then Thomas partnered with me. And now Daniel Bulut came and partnered. It's, you know, you can help them and they can get the product out. It has to be a partnership again. Somebody has to think. It's not easy for you all. And I, again, it's a societal thing that we have to well, And that's my question and my comment is we've recently, none of us like to see these things in the news, whether it's our competitor, or whatever. Anything that causes a lack of confidence in the consumer hurts us all. It's not a competitive, food safety is never going to be, should never be a competitive product. We're all in it together. So how do you, does it keep you up at night? How do you think about this? Okay, um, this is, I have emails in my inbox today from uh, our head of quality assurance that says look at this advert, look at this piece of news to our cross-functional executive working group that literally said, be very careful and watch local produce. You need to understand how that is. We made a decision yesterday for this test that we're doing to not use these whole heads of lettuce. It hurts me. I love them. It's cool. It's nice to have this quartered head of baby lettuce sitting there on the bar that looks like this baby wedge salad on the plate. And the Ferrari as a chef, I love it. I really love it there. But practicality, there's labor involved in cutting them, there's a washing step included in it. It took us two weeks in the restaurant to get the restaurant to be able to execute it. They had to wash out the sink before they washed it because I have no idea. We walked in and there were ribs force thawing under some water in the, rest, in the sink and now they're going to wash their lettuce after they had some raw ribs inside of it, right? All of these components play into it. The ultimate decision came back and said food safety is number one. We must serve safe food or it can close our restaurants. Yeah, love it. It, it is, it's the end game of it. In New York City, uh, yes, I remember the first time we got a suit, we got a cryovac machine and I literally, the health inspector came and what is the first thing I did? I ran downstairs, covered in a cloth, put it in my office underneath the desk and it wasn't two weeks later that, you know, David Chang gets closed down, right? Because he has, he was sous vide stuff in the restaurant and he didn't have the proper procedure for it. Today, it's not an option. You have to. Food safety is uber important. It can close your business down. 800 restaurants closing down, big, we're in trouble. Thing, yeah. One restaurant, it was interesting because while I was here in New York, I go, to, I go to restaurants, I look, I watch. There's not a, a fancy bar in New York City that's using gloves to place no, no, garnishes in their bowl. All the rules. Right? I'm going to slap the basil and put it on. Oh, no, no, no. I can't slap basil in my restaurant. I mean, listen, it's sexy to slap basil and have it, the beautiful scent and the smell. I can't do it. I can't do anything. I can take a pair of tongs and take it out of a container and put it in, but I gotta be careful about it, right? If I'm gonna make Ruby Tuesday be this produce-centric house, there's all sorts of hurdles to get over that, and this is it's just one of them. It's one of the hurdles to get done. We can figure it out. 100% we can figure it out. We can figure out how to bring the product in, get a baby leaf that looks in the same idea. The goal is to have a knife and fork option. That's still a knife and fork option. Is it the ultimate the way you wanted it to be? No, it's still not the Ferrari, but in the consumer's mind, I don't know if they know that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you have to take the chef mentality, the consumer mentality, and look at it both ways. Delonica, Georgia is a restaurant I use often for myself as a benchmark. Delonica, Georgia, let me tell you, they're, they're not, they're not going to know what that leaf of lettuce is. The iceberg and romaine mix is going to be the big mover. But in New York City, they're going to use a lot of this other one, right? And there's a balance to that. All right, let's go over here and then we'll go over here to so the gentleman in the blue. Thank you, thank you. This has been a great session. So for all the panelists, I'd be curious where it's relevant. You mentioned how you want a wish list from your vendors, your suppliers or the partnership, Chef, I appreciate you mentioning that. What about, I didn't hear a lot of talk about, and I, I struggle to use this word because we don't think we're this, but how about with the various marketing or commodity boards for produce? What's been your experience in working with those organizations or not working with those organizations? 
I can speak to it a little bit. I think th there's a lot of information that can come through the marketing boards, and the marketing boards can be catalysts for the products that are there. The marketing boards for these products have to be the middleman sometimes between the restaurateur chef mentality to the grower farmer. It's going to be very hard for me to speak. To, I had a conversation with a pear farmer. I, I remember this conversation. It was this conversation with the pear farmer has like it's been in my mind forever. The pear farmer, how do you get the best pears? Oh, I pick them. I'm sitting on my back porch in a crate, and they sit there for three months. And when they start to smell, I start to eat them. <laughs> I mean, listen. Exactly. And the pears are delicious. They're like soft and mushy, and like they start to smell good, and he starts to eat them. Okay. I'm a restaurant. I want a pear. How do I get a right pear? Don't. I, I age. I age pears in my restaurant. I, I, I mean, I stage tomatoes in my restaurant today, and it's like, how do I, you know, staging tomatoes? I still walk into restaurants, and they're in the refrigerator. I have charts and graphs and trays, and like teach them how to do it. But pe staging pears? I, oh my gosh, we can't stage a pear. Well, we have to then figure out how to make that work. And the commodity boards, I think, can be that middleman between how do you get the best flavor. All of us on this board want the best flavor. All of us. We want the best flavor to serve to our guests. How do we get the best flavor from the farmer? And the farmer knows how to do it. When you're at your farm, how do you get the best flavor? I go out in the morning. I pick the corn in the morning. I cook it. I take it to lunch. That's what I did as a kid. Right? That's the best flavor. But how do we get that to our restaurants? Yeah, we use them all. We use them all the time um, for our, particularly our new retail location uh, menu change, uh, Browns. Uh, you know, we wanted to find a local chickpea. We call the uh, chickpea board, you know, for avocados, talking to Peggy McCormick at uh, California Avocados and things like that. But uh, they're, they're, they've been incredibly helpful and they're actually free consulting. Often too, too many times though, they, once we get done with, you know, one item or something like our, our menu at uh, Brown's uh, and they want to have a special event that they can do a marketing thing for to show the boss and you know uh, the people that are paying their salary but how do you make it more of a long-term thing and how do you create more of a partnership that mindset at least I haven't found it there in the commodity board yet but uh, maybe one person's out here gonna hear, hear me speak and say it because I think that there is uh, more uh, to come from that mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, All right, let's go here and then back there. My question is for Lisa. I'm anxious to learn a little bit more about the development of your burger product with mushrooms. A couple of questions. Is it available through the USDA um, meal program for schools nationwide? Were you using commodity meat when you made it? And just as a point of interest, the USDA requires children to have two servings of of a beef product if they're or two credible. Right. I guess I guess they call it two MMAs. Two MMA. Yeah. Were you able to use less meat when you supplemented it with the mushroom, or did you have to add the mushroom to the weight of the product? So, right now. IQF mushrooms are available as a USDA commodity that can be processed, further processed. Beef is available as a USDA commodity that can be further processed. We have accounts in 33 states. We are doing 33 different things across the country with meat and mushrooms to create that burger. Mm. Um, on the commercial side, it's one skew. Um, on the commodity side, it is a Similar product, different SKU number. So it's basically the same product. Just depends on do they process meat, do they process mushrooms, do they process both. Um, so it's a little bit confusing, but at least from a formulation standpoint, the product's identical. Um, not sure if that answers the question uh, or not. Uh, there is no meat mushroom blend burger on the USDA commodity list that you can buy as a brown box item. Yes, so that's you have what to I was wondering. Process. Yeah, right, at least right now. I just give a recipe to Google for a, a meatloaf and a burger that I use with mushrooms. 
They are now in West, Bon Appetit is having to buy a machine that will mix the two USDA approved ingredients and form them into meatloafs and burgers. It's a huge investment, but Bon Appetit was willing to do it after much fighting and struggle between Google and Bon Appetit, who'll pay for it, but it needs a new machine that then, because it's contamination. They even tried to tell the beef producer, you know, at the end of the day, make the mushroom beef burgers. No, I'm not taking the risk. So it's a, it was a struggle to get there. Although with the USDA commodity IQF diced mushroom, there's been a kill step, so they're clean. I mean, there's no, you can mix those, bring them in frozen, mix them with meat, and you're, you're fine. Um, there's not, uh, the microload's been reduced to almost nothing. Um, so in, in terms of the actual burger, the answer is yes and no. So for the elementary school burger, we actually had a slight reduction um, in the meat product we were serving. We were serving a 1.75 MMA. We went to a one and a half, the mushroom extends the burger so we have the same bun coverage. But I don't know a whole lot of children in America that eat plain burgers. Almost every single one of them puts a piece of cheese on it. Uh. So the extra half or a quarter is coming from the cheese that's on the burger, also a USDA commodity. For high school, we went with a two MMA formulation and then we've got, I wanna say it's about an eighth of a cup of mushroom. It's a little bit more than an eighth and we don't credit it. Um, we don't talk actually, about. we talk about the mushroom, but we don't credit it as part of the half cup requirement because we still want them to eat the half cup. Okay, good. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. That's wonderful. Let's go to this gentleman back here. Hi. Um, I'm in the produce business. I was born and raised in it. I'm also in the national restaurant chain business. If you want to know and understand my business, look it up on Google and you figure out what we are and who we are, then you come see me and sell me. So I'm going to tell you the same thing. If you want to know and understand this business, get out there and find out about it. Small farmers, great. My father had a bunch of them. Today is not 1960. We live in a whole different ballgame. You have to elevate your suppliers to the level for which you can buy a whole head of lettuce and have it shipped to your restaurant. I know, we do it to 6,000. It can be done, but you have to know and understand your industry. Anytime something happens and the first word out of their mouth is, it's produce because there's not a kill step, it kills all of our business. Exactly. So, Make, go back to your place and just say, hey, where are we at? We got to elevate. And you have to elevate because they're, they're elevating for you. But you got to go after it and find the right ones to do it. And you got to have good partners to help you. I am fighting every day. And I, I wish you would see the, the in-depth conversations that I have regarding produce. P people freak out. I, I, have a, I have a company that I work with that freaks out when I start getting excited about produce. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really do. They don't know how to react. They don't know how to get, how to get excited to it, right? They know the end game of what we need to get there, right? Publicly traded company, conscientious, 43 years in business, never thought about it in this manner. It has to change. Who's changing produce today? Who's investing in farms? Who's investing in technologies? Who's investing in this for the future? Are the startups and the people of tomorrow, the people that are mm -hmm. the low, the Silicon Valley types, the Zuckerbergs, the people like that, they're pushing this Correct. from that aspect right now. It's going to take changing restaurant companies that are 43 years old and have a hell of a lot of history that don't feel comfortable with it. That's going to take people to speak up, going to take people to push the exactly. envelope to get it done. It's hard. It is not easy. Don't get me wrong. But this is where I'm saying partnership and understanding how it can be done to get it done. Listen, I'm not going to be the produce vendor that knows I'm a chef. I'm not going to know every aspect of your business. I don't know. And I can't know every aspect no, you of can't. your business. But what I can do is we can start to, t listen, I, I don't have time to be here today. I don't. But you know why I'm here? Because I need to make time to be here. That's why I'm here. I literally have a whole bunch of stuff to get done. <laughs> but you made the time. I mean, all of us, right? But I'm here because there's conversations that take place to start these conversations and get them rolling. You have to take the bull by the horn sometimes and wrestle them to the ground. I don't want to give up on my lettuce. I don't want to give up on my lettuce. But you know what? I have 75 other items that I have to fight equally for at this very moment that I need to figure out as well. 
right? So let me get this going, get it out, and then I'm going to go fight back for this item. Well, you know, I, I, I understand that. I don't need this thing. I understand that. <laughs> I, I do. I truly understand it. I, I buy $700 million worth of products. So trust me, time is precious. Yeah. But you got to know what's going on. And, and you can get these products because there are out there. Out there. I'm not telling you. I don't. No. There are guys who grow better than anything you'll ever see in this world. Nobody else can grow like farmers in the United States. I don't care. You put any country, any flavor, anything you want. Our technology leads everything. The amount of money they spend at quality assurance gives me the ability to have all headlines in my restaurants. Yeah. And let me tell you, it's there. You have to know your partner. You guys need to have a beer together as soon as this session ends, <laughs> which is going to be in about a minute and a half. Um, so I, thank you, thank you, thank you to folks in the audience with your very thoughtful. what the millennials and Gen Zers are doing to drive change in terms of health, wellness, and sustainability. Suveer, thank you for partnering, doing the demos, being here with us today, and sharing your insights and your passion. Lisa, I've thanked you publicly before, and I'm going to do it again. Everything that you do to advance school nutrition in this country is so critically important. I wish I could triple your budget with the snap of my finger to make things slightly easier in the challenges you take on each day. Justin, I'm kind of jealous of your job. You get to represent fantastic farmers in Florida every day, doing great work to increase produce consumption with consumers and give them culinary confidence and competence. And Peter, the Prince of Produce, thank you for giving us your precious time and your inserts today. I can't wait to hear your presentation in January about the new salad bar for Bubba. With that, thanks everybody. I'll turn it back to Ken or Owen or Jim.